Good morning, everyone. We're going to pick back up with the Lewis structures of the nitrite and sulfate ions. And so I just thought we'd go back through the kind of process for determining the Lewis structures and then trying to talk about resonance. So 5 plus 2 times 6 plus 1. Just remember for the anions, add the extra electron for the negative charge. So 5 for nitrogen, 2 times 6 for the oxygens. That gives us a total of 18 electrons to distribute for the molecule. I wouldn't necessarily guess a Lewis structure unless you know it for sure. And there's not too many that I even necessarily have memorized. I would try to sit here and try to figure out, you know, by first single bonding the non-central atoms to the central atom. So the two oxygens have to be connected to nitrogen. So that's, I think, fairly straightforward. And then once you connect the two central atoms to give them their octet, then we count electrons. So then we count the electrons and realize that we've distributed 16 electrons. So there's two electrons that haven't been assigned to the Lewis structure. And so those two electrons we place onto the central atom. So that's how we know to put a lone pair of electrons onto nitrogen. And then if we want to continue the structure, the issue would be, can we, can we get nitrogen to satisfy the octet rule using multiple bonds? But we need to look at the formal charges first. If we look at the formal charge of nitrogen, nitrogen should have five electrons around it. And if it did, it would have a neutral charge. Nitrogen here only has four electrons closest to it. So if we put the electrons or break the bonds in half, then I only have four electrons around each nitrogen atom. That's how I calculate the charge on nitrogen. The formal charge is five minus four for plus one. So the formal charge of nitrogen is plus one. So I have this positive formal charge. I don't have the octet yet satisfied. I only have a total of six electrons around the nitrite ion. So I can pull say these two electrons in make a double bond. So these electrons move in to make that double bond so that oxygen still has eight electrons around it. I'm not creating or destroying electrons, I'm just moving them around the molecule. I make this double bonded structure. But then the issue is, why don't I make the double bond with the other oxygen instead? You know, once I make the double bond, I reduce the formal charge down to zero. So when I make this double bond, this formal charge here now becomes zero because it's now five minus five, reducing the formal charge of nitrogen. So when I make a double bond, I wanna lower the magnitudes of the formal charge. The oxygens were minus. So each oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons around it. Only need six for a neutral charge. So the oxygen that has the single bond is a six minus seven for minus one formal charge. And the one that I've made the double bond with now is 6 minus 6 for neutral. So I have a neutral oxygen on the one side, a negative one on the other. And what I have to realize, or what we have to realize, is that whenever we have a Lewis structure where I can sketch an equivalent yet different Lewis structure, then the molecule is not going to exist as either one of those Lewis structures. So when I realize I can make this double bond here instead, put this electron pair back onto the oxygen atom, and then I use this little arrow here to imply resonance. It's like a, not to imply an equilibrium, but this implies that there must be some kind of resonating electron pair going on. What I'm doing is I'm resonating the electrons through both oxygens, and this is going to be an effect that takes place at all times. And this is, I, I don't know why this is such a challenging concept sometimes to understand, that it's never the one Lewis structure or the other, it's always going to be the average of those two Lewis structures. So if I call one of these structures, let's call this one A, let's call this one B, that the molecule is never A or never B, the ion always exists as the average of those two structures. So the real molecule exists more like nitrogen lone pair. The bond's actually going to have a bent bond angle. We'll talk about why that is in more detail in the next chapter, but it's like we get that extra bond simultaneously across the two oxygens. So instead of having a double here and a single here, or a double here and a single here, and it's just going back and forth, it just resonates at all times, such that the bond links end up being exactly equal in length. The next slide's gonna talk about bond link trends. We've already seen that double bonds are shorter, single bonds are longer, but this molecule should have two equal bonds. So these bonds here should have an equal bond distance. So if I think of the bond length here, that that should equal the bond length here. 
So NO2 minus should have two equal bond lengths. Not one short, one long. And I'll show you a test in a minute how we can do some computational modeling. You could look at a crystal structure of this ion 2 um, from an experimental standpoint and kind of see that those bonds are exactly equal in length in the real ion. So one of the, the things with our modeling here, when we write a Lewis structure, until this point of resonance appearing, every Lewis structure we could only write one of. Like if you go back like CO2, there's one acceptable Lewis structure, so the molecule kind of resembles or will look like that one Lewis structure. Water has one Lewis structure, so it looks, looks like the one. Here, where I have two Lewis structures that are equivalent, it's just that the real molecule will resemble the average of those two Lewis structures. So it's kind of giving us a picture of, of what it means to come up with this Lewis structure model, that it is a model, and then when I have two equivalent structures, or if I have more than one possible uh, resonance structure, the real molecule looks like the average of the composite of those structures. And then in some cases, this could be even more confusing, but maybe not. Like sulfate um, has a couple of different Lewis structures we can sketch. One of them is really easy to interpret, and I think it's the best Lewis structure. This is kind of what we were getting at at the end of class. So um, sulfate, 6 plus 4 times 6 plus 2. So that's uh, 6 plus 24 plus 2 is 32 electrons. And so sulfate should look like a central sulfur, four oxygens, lone pairs on the O's, just following the usual rules, attach the non-centrals to the central atom, give them an octet. That's all 32 electrons, so no lone pairs for sulfur. So I have nothing left over for the sulfur atom in terms of a lone pair. And then the only question becomes, what do I do about this two plus formal charge? The formal charge on sulfur is plus two. I actually don't think that's a bad thing. That's actually good, right? Because oxygen's more electronegative. Oxygen wants electrons more. Why take electrons off the electronegative atom and put them onto the less electronegative atom? That just doesn't make a lot of sense. So I think this is the best Lewis structure. And then we just end up having negative formal charges on the oxygens and a plus two on the sulfur. So four negatives, plus two overall minus two. Well, that, that's what I'm going to get at. So I think it's acceptable. I still think it, it's it may be useful to see that this is probably the better Lewis structure, but then it would be acceptable if we wanted to reduce the magnitudes of formal charge. There's really no rule in our Lewis structure rules that say that it's wrong to do this. So our Lewis structure rules say you can make multiple bonds. Generally, we're trying to satisfy the octet rule, like for, for the nitride ion. It's like nitrogen has a deficiency in its octet, meaning it has room for electrons, and it has a charge to pull them in. So why not make a double bond? And it does. Um, and so then sulfate, it's kind of like, well, we have the charge. We don't really have the room for electrons. But a lot of people, a lot of books, a lot of resources will write this structure. So I think it's acceptable to write this structure we'd write it this way. So we're just making a double bond here, making another double bond. But if we make this molecule, we still have to picture not too short, too long bonds in the molecule, but somehow we'd have to get resonance. So somehow we'd have to, and I don't necessarily want to go through every permutation, but we'd have the double bonds um, in this position here, and then every other permutation. So we'd have a bunch of Lewis structures to sketch that are all equivalent. Two double bonds here, two here, two here. Yeah. Okay, but even, so if the actual molecule still still the average between the molecule with the double bond and the Exactly. And, and, and to me, like, some structures will make more sense in terms of predicting bond length trends. So sulfate from the best Lewis structure that we boxed, of course we would predict four equivalent bonds because they're four single bonds. Of course they're going to be the same length. But if we are picturing this, I would say these Lewis structures here are acceptable. There's nothing really that says these are wrong in terms of like our Lewis structure rules. A third row atom like sulfur can theoretically expand its octet. There's no uh, rule against that. We do see things like SF6 do exist where sulfur expands its octet um, in like a molecule that truly exists. And, and I really like to stress that when we're writing Lewis structures here, these are common ions, right? These are things that exist. We're not writing Lewis structures for hypothetical molecules or things that aren't stable enough to make into compounds or to ship across the country. Um, so SF6, you can get it in a gas cylinder. I mentioned you can breathe it in in a demo. Uh, not super fun to do, 
But, but the key here is that no matter which structure you're picturing, the bond lengths are still the same length. You're still going to have this concept of resonance. So the real molecule of sulfate, if we're picturing it this way here, we end up with all four bonds being equivalent in length. And so there's a question I think we'll just pass over it pretty quickly when we get to it. But there's a question, like a multiple choice one, a few uh, um, slides ahead in the notes that are like, for sulfate, are two of its bonds shorter, two of it longer? Or are they all the same length? All the bonds in sulfate have the exact same bond length. Yeah, yeah. So I think the question kind of becomes, what difference does it make? Like, what are we arguing about? And, and the answer is mainly semantics that people like to, some, some instructors really like these low structures. Some really like the one that I boxed. And in, in a way, I think what, you know, what we might want to try to do is try to think about what the real molecule cares about. Do we really think sulfur is going to have a zero charge in a real molecule? Probably not, right? Because it doesn't want electrons as much as oxygen. It's not as electronegative. Oxygen has a stronger pull. So even if we're making double bonds, the, the oxygens are going to try to pull the electrons back onto themselves. If we get into bonding theories, which we do in the next chapter, we will not find a bonding theory that supports double bonds. So we won't be able to find a way to kind of support what goes on at a molecular like orbital level with those double bonds in place. Uh, this slide here, we're just trying to get at bond length trends. Uh, for molecules, just kind of a reminder and a rehashing of, you know, basically that double bonds are shorter, or this is actually bond strengths, I'm sorry, but that um, double bonds are stronger than single bonds, but we also are seeing double bonds are shorter. So as you shorten a bond, you strengthen it, you make a triple bond even shorter, even stronger. So just kind of reminding ourselves of some bond length trends from chapter five, um, that we do get this idea or this picture that single bonds longer, weaker, double bonds shorter, stronger, triple bonds even shorter, even stronger. So let's take a look at a couple of different quantum mechanical calculations you can do because th these types of calculations are pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Some of these calculations only take a couple of minutes depending on the type of theory that you're using. But what this modeling allows you to do is just get a glimpse of what some of these real molecules look like. Let's start with sulfate. And this thing here is, might be slightly buggy as I figure out how to click onto this. So here's the result of the calculation on sulfate. And one of the things that we can do is just kind of verify that all, all these bonds are the same length. So 1.513, 1 1.513, 1 the bond length's down in the left corner. And then if we check another one of the bond lengths, 1.513. So all these bonds, are exactly the same length. And so you can do the computational modeling and see that whether or not this truly has two double bonds and two single bonds that are averaging out, or if it's single bonds, they look like single bonds here. The, the program only knows how to call a bond single versus double based on bond length trend. So there's not a whole lot of actual like reason why the program shows you a single versus a double bond other than some just general bond length trends. But, but it appears that they would be better described as single bonds. So I think sulfate's looking like the single bonded structure that, that I was saying was probably the best structure. Yeah, kind of up to interpretation, how do we get tested on those structures? Well, the, the, that's a good question. I mean, usually the, the questions I would like to ask is just like, what are the relative bond length trends? Like for sulfate, I think the best question would be, consider the Lewis structure and the bonding in sulfate, which question's correct? You know, like, are all of its bonds the same length? Because whether or not you think it's two double and two single or four single, all the bonds are still the same length. Um, another question that, that we tend to ask is just, well, what is, like, which of the given Lewis structures is acceptable for a particular molecule? And so then you can go through a particular molecule and try to think of which ones are acceptable. There'll be a bunch of practice tests in the quizzes, I think, will show you that, um, that, it's, that we don't get too tedious, but the, the key detail though is whenever, you, it's like you have to recognize the resonance. It's like we might show you a, a one structure, um, uh, like imagine we show you one of the Lewis structures of nitrite, and then we just ask a question, are all its bonds the same length? And there you have to kind of be in tune to be like, well, it does have a second Lewis structure that's equivalent, those bonds would resonate. So I think there are some questions where we might mislead you or try to trick you, it's not my intent, but. Uh, but sometimes those types of questions are written. You might see some of those. So I think it's trying to interpret when resonance occurs. So it's, it's whenever you have a structure 
that you can write more than one Lewis structure that's equivalent yet different than what it's representing. Uh, let's look at a couple other. Like I did a, a bunch of calculations. I don't know if I can show or have the time to show all of these. I have nitrite here somewhere. Oh, that's NO minus. So here's the nitrite ion, has that bent bond that I was talking about, but let's look at its bond lengths. So if we compare its bond length trends, we see 1.266, 1.266. So again, same bond lengths for those molecules. One other detail, and I could go back to the, the sulfate to show this too, is you get a picture of charge. The charge modeling isn't great. It's not as good as the bond length modeling in these calculations. But if you notice, in nitrite, the nitrogen atom in our Lewis structures on the previous page, they were all zero formal charge. Oxygen's more electronegative, so oxygen's pulling a little bit of charge towards itself. Nitrogen develops a small partial positive charge. So we can usually understand and comprehend the, the bonding trends. Let's go back to sulfate real quick, because I want to show you the charges. Because if it were the double and two, sing two doubles and two singles, the charge on sulfur would have been neutral, and the charge on sulfur is well over two plus. So the charge on sulfur here, plus 2.5 units. So not only is sulfur not zero, it's actually more positive than plus two, according to these results. Now these charges aren't super accurate, so I don't necessarily think that this is like 100% correct. We might want to do more uh, investigating to really look at the true charges. But the charge of sulfur would be expected to be positive in the, in the, um, the real molecule of sulfate. Uh, remember how we were looking at um, BF3. So for BF3, remember how we were thinking, will BF3, if I can sketch something here. So remember how BF3, we were thinking, will it make a double bond? So we have these three fluorines, lone pairs are on the fluorine, boron's deficient of an octet. Remember how we were considering, do we make a double bond? And if we did so, boron would pick up a negative charge. And how we talked about that's bad. Boron's not electronegative. Boron doesn't want electron density. It doesn't have a strong pull to make a double bond. So we leave those single. So let's take a look at BF3. As soon as I remember how to scroll on this silly thing. Well, okay, it's, I, it was always tricky when I was doing this in my office too to get it to scroll down. Um, but for BF3, all the bonds of course were the same length and then the charge on boron wasn't negative, it was positive. And it was, of course it's positive because fluorine is more electronegative and it's pulling electrons towards itself. You see this in like SF6, I can click on the ones that are at least at the top here. So SF6 is kind of in the same regard as BF3. We have six fluorines attached to a central atom of sulfur. All of them have the same length, but let's look at the charge on sulfur. The charge on sulfur is not what I would have expected it to be. Um, I think there's something actually wrong with this calculation because I had done one earlier uh, where it was more positive. But you would expect the charge on sulfur to be more positive and the charge on fluorine to be pulling electrons off the sulfur. Let me look at CF4 is another one that kind of does this where we have four fluorines attached to carbon. Those bonds are polarized. And so we should be, uh, you know, we should have, why is it doing that? So we should have um, positive charge building up on carbon, and we do. So carbon has a big positive charge. Fluorines have a big negative charge. I don't know what's up with that SF6 calculation. It's funny, I did one and repeated it and didn't actually check it. But something, I must have clicked the wrong box on the calculation. So, But sulfur should have a pretty big positive charge. Its, it's charge is usually around plus two to three, depending on the, the computational method. The charge in the fluorines are about the same, if not a little bit greater than the CF4 molecule, meaning fluorine's picking up a big negative charge, pulling electrons off of sulfur. So the idea is the Lewis structure shows a bunch of electrons around sulfur, the fluorines make room for them. The fluorines are almost trying to pull those electrons back off of sulfur so that it doesn't really have to expand its octet. 
So when we think expanding octets or not meeting octets, a lot of that is kind of doesn't matter. What really matters for atoms is the relative balance of charge. You know, what really matters is, are the atoms capable of holding onto the electrons closest to them? Do they have room for more? Are they kind of filled in terms of their vacancies, if you will? So like a second row atom like fluorine, it has room for eight electrons in its valence shell. And that's it, it's not gonna take nine, but it really wants eight as much as it can. Um, and it's gonna pull all those eight towards itself um, with the strongest pull of any other uh, um, atoms on the periodic table uh, towards itself. So when fluorine's in bonds, it's pulling electrons towards itself. It's trying to ionize, but most of the other atoms just aren't quite willing to give the electron up totally. So remember like lithium fluoride, would just the lithium would say, just take the electron, you can keep it. But like hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen just keeps a hold of the electron a little bit because hydrogen's ionization energy is really high. So hydrogen just keeps the electron close to itself, but just lets fluorine have more of the electron or have it be closer towards the fluorine atom. Okay, so hopefully just looking at a couple of those um, calculations, really driving home, I hope, the message of what resonance effect really is. It's the averaging out of the Lewis structures that we can sketch and trying just to remind ourselves that the Lewis structures we are writing are just a model. And the question is, does the model actually match reality? And when you have one Lewis structure you can sketch for a molecule, it matches reality really well. When you have two Lewis structures you can sketch that are equivalent yet different, the reality is more of an average of the two, or a composite. This is just comparing bond length trends, how we were talking single longer than double, longer than triple. And you can see that trend as you go from carbon-carbon bonds to carbon-nitrogen bonds to carbon-oxygen bonds, um, that you can see the trend kind of continues that single bonds always longer than double, always longer than triple. This is that question I was alluding to for sulfate. So for sulfate, no matter what model you look at, whether it's two double, two single, or four single, which are probably for it a better model, all of its bonds have to be equal in length. So just kind of have that in the back of your mind for almost all the ions we'd ever ask about. Like if you go to, like carbonate does this. So if you look at CO3, two minus, you get a central carbon, three oxygens, lone pairs around the O's, and then you have four plus three times six plus two, so that's 18 plus six, that's 24 electrons. So that's all 24 distributed, but I have this positive charge, so I can make one double bond. So I make one double bond that can resonate across the other two oxygens, so I can have this Lewis structure as well, and then I can also have this Lewis structure. So I can write those three equivalent yet different Lewis structures, so all the CO bonds in carbonate are equal in length. So that's the basic message here, that when we have resonance taking place, it's averaging out those Lewis structures. So then for carbonate, probably a better structure. Only tricky thing is it's hard to write all the electrons into this structure, is just to kind of think of this structure here having one, two, three, four bonding pairs of electrons that are spraying across the three bonds. And so this is just kind of driving back to the whole point or the whole idea of trying to calculate like a relative bond order and just coming back to the idea that a double bond has a bond order of two, a single bond has a bond order of one, and this bond here would be somewhere in between. And so then we can compare bond length trends, you know, so we can look at bond order and use it to help bond length um, um, sort of rank these molecules and their trends of bond length. And so according to their Lewis structures, and then we're told here that obey the octet rule, and these are actually second row atoms, so I didn't really need to say that. Um, but for these structures, when we have atoms in the second row, we can't expand octets. What that means is that we're trying to um, satisfy the octet rule for both atoms. NO minus 5 plus 6 plus 1, that's 12 electrons. So that's a double bond. So I end up with the Lewis structure that has a negative formal charge on N, but there's no way around this because I have to satisfy the octet rule. And then oxygen ends up with a formal charge of 0. So it might seem strange at first that nitrogen, we did this Lewis structure previously, but nitrogen has a negative formal charge, oxygen zero, despite oxygen being less electronegative. Now, what do you think the bond does? The bond's polarized. So the formal charges are just kind of, um, I was talking with one of my colleagues yesterday, we were like, formal charges are always wrong. They're like, the only time they're right is if you have a molecule like O2 or N2 or H2 where they're calculated to be zero, and the true charges are zero. The formal charges are just kind of 
a way to set what the charge would be if that bond's equally shared. And bonds are never going to be equally shared if the atoms are different. So N and O are different from each other. So oxygen's gonna pull the electrons towards itself. It's gonna win back some negative charge. Nitrogen's gonna lose some negative charge. And in the end, they're both gonna probably have some negative charge. I did this calculation, we can look at it. The charges of both atoms are both negative. It's not super exciting. Um, NO2 minus, we were looking at this earlier, but this is the nitrogen double bond, or lone pair on the nitrogen. And then we have the structure here. You might think of writing one of the Lewis structures, because if we write one of the Lewis structures of the molecule, we can then picture the, the, the other Lewis structure, the idea of how the electrons are resonating. And then we can kind of see those electrons that resonate through the molecule. There's a question, I don't know if this is more of a chapter nine uh, question or chapter eight, but there's a question that gets at the pi system. How many electrons are involved in this pi system? I think it's more of a chapter nine question, so we might come back and talk about this more later. But you have these two electrons here that are resonating to here, and then you have these two electrons moving over to here. So you have four electrons in the pi system for the nitrate, uh, for the nitrite ion. Um, I, but I think that's a chapter nine topic that we'll come back to like counting how many electrons are involved in pi systems. Uh, we showed a picture of what a pi system is. is the, that, that was the bonding picture of all the orbitals at simultaneous overlap. So you get one orbital that accepts that double bond across the two bonds at the same time. But this, um, the one Lewis structure here is how you can predict that you have three bonding pairs that are spreading themselves out across the two NO bonds. So the three halves bond or the 1.5 bond order. So it's like one and a half of a bond. The NO, of course, is a double bond. That's two bonding pairs that are spread across the one NO bond. So the bond order would be two. So that's just a, 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 a two bond or a double bond. Bond order is another thing that you can call that. So the bond order is two for the double bond. The bond order is one and a half for the nitride ion. And if we're comparing nitrate, so we have nitrate is like carbonate in a way, but NO3 minus five plus three times six plus one, that's 24 electrons. So we get to this Lewis structure here, just like we had for carbonate, then we can make one double bond. So we make one double bond. We then can have the resonating effect just like we had in carbonate. The only issue is the charge on nitrogen of positive can't be reduced with another double bond because that would require breaking the octet rule for nitrogen. We can't expand second row octets. And so then we can move these electrons here. So these two electrons move to here, these two electrons move back, and then we can also move these two electrons in, move those back. So we end up having six pi electrons involved in nitrate. But again, counting pi system electrons will be probably something we bring up again in chapter nine. But you can sort of see and count those electrons here. And so the only difference for nitrate compared to nitrite is that you only have four bonding pairs of electrons spreading across three bonds, so the bond order becomes one and one third. So you have four bonding pairs spread across the three NO bonds. So your bond order is 1.33. And so we have a double bond, we have a one and a half bond, we have a one and a third bond. And so the bond link trend here should be that the double bond's shorter, the one and a half bond is shorter, the 1.33 bond is the longest. So the more bonding pairs of electrons, the shorter the bond. Okay, so we can, we can use the sort of pictures of bonding, the relative or the fractional bond orders to sort of rank these bond link trends. Now, the reason why you might rank bond link trends is just to kind of compare and test the model. The model failed. <laughs> so I won't show you the results. But the bond links are actually very complicated. This is, you know, like you will compare and rank some bond links because I think it helps us examine if you get the right bond orders, the right Lewis structures, the right bonding picture. So it's just a way to kind of test if you have a right picture of double bonds shorter, single bonds longer. Uh, but actual bond lengths are much more complicated than just depending on bond order. So there's more um, that impacts bond lengths than just the bond order. 
If you imagine like um, HF, for example, hydrogen fluoride is actually quite short because you have the, the high charges on H and F shortening the bond because of electrostatic forces of attraction. So when we make polarized bonds, you put those partial charges on the bond, they serve to shrink the bond from what it would have been if the bond wasn't polarized. Um, so there's more effects in bond length than just the bond order. But this question did say just to rank the bond lengths just using the picture of bond order. So the lesser the bond order, the fewer the bonding electrons, like the less glue holding the nuclei together. So double shorter, single longer. So we're closer to single on this side, and single bonds are just longer than double bonds. Now we have a couple other Lewis structures, uh, mainly for molecules like hydroxyl radical, um, nitrogen oxide with, with just uh, without a charge. How do we do a Lewis structure when the count's odd? So when we have oxygen has six electrons, hydrogen has one, uh, a Lewis structure for the, the hydroxyl radical is relatively easy because we just follow our basic rule that we attach hydrogen with a single bond and then we have seven electrons available, we distributed two, so the five electrons left over go on to oxygen. So that's pretty straightforward that we come up with the structure for O where we're deficient in an octet, but when we have an odd count, one of the atoms has to not be satisfied, doesn't have to have. When we have an odd count, one atom by definition can't have its octet completed with eight electrons. And so just by kind of rule, we end up with that being oxygen, um, that oxygen ends up still having a zero formal charge. Hydrogen has a zero formal charge. So it's interesting that a um, now hydroxyl radical, you're not going to buy it, but it, it does exist in the atmosphere. Um, so it's at least stable in some regard that it exists as a stable molecule with neutral formal charges. Now, what do you expect the actual charge of oxygen to be? Oxygen is really going to have some partial negative, hydrogen some partial positive due to the bond polarity, the electronegativity difference. So of course the formal charges are wrong, but it helps us predict where the real charge might lie, negative towards the more electronegative O. What about nitrogen oxide, the NO? So we have five plus six. And so now this one here, like how do we picture 11 electrons total by rule? If we kind of come back to trying to satisfy the octet rule, like imagine if we had one more electron. If we had one more electron, that's NO minus, and we just did that Lewis structure, so that one looked like this. So this is NO minus. So it's like what I have to do is I have to kick an electron off the N or the O. So if I go to NO minus and then try to remove the minus, then I'm going to remove either this electron or I'm going to remove one off the O. So it's like do I kick an electron off of nitrogen or off of oxygen? And so let me just sketch nitrogen with just one electron here and let me try to make sure I'm carefully showing oxygen with just one electron here and trying to decide which of those two Lewis structures is better. So how might you try to decide which Lewis structure is better? Well, this is actually a, a real use. This is actually where the real formal charge rule comes into play. The formal charge rule is if we can minimize the magnitudes of formal charge, the Lewis structure with the minimized Lewis charges, the minimized formal charges will be the correct structure. And so if I look at this Lewis structure here, my formal charge on nitrogen Nitrogen should have five and it does, so that's neutral. Oxygen should have six and it does, that's neutral. So that looks to be pretty good. And if I look at this structure over here, this is gonna be probably pretty bad because nitrogen has a negative formal charge and then oxygen has a positive formal charge. Why is oxygen positive? Well, it should have six, only has five. Nitrogen should have five and it has six. And so why would nitrogen go negative, oxygen go positive in a molecule like NO? The answer is it wouldn't. And so we want to minimize the magnitudes of formal charge if we can. Now, the only like, caveat to think about is when you're choosing between two Lewis structures, that sometimes the tendency might be to want to put the more negative charge on the, on the more electronegative atom, but the issue is trying to come up with zero and zero if we can. So if we can minimize the formal charges, that would be better overall. That kind of comes up with CLO. So for CLO, we have seven plus six, we have 13 electrons. And so what I like to think is just kind of like for NO, think about CLO minus real quick. So first picture CLO minus, that's 14 electrons. 14's perfect for a single bond. So we'd have single all the way around, and then we need to kick an electron off the chlorine or off the oxygen. 
And so we either need to kick an electron off of chlorine. Let's write that Lewis structure. Oops. Oh, that's stupid erase button. So I just want to leave oxygen as it was in one of the cases and then choose the other Lewis structure to be where we have oxygen with a lost electron, chlorine with its original three pairs of electrons. So do we kick the electron off of chlorine or off the oxygen? Well, let's think about formal charges. So for the formal charge of chlorine, for the first molecule, it should have seven and it only has six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So that's plus one. And then oxygen should have six and it has seven. So now that, that looks good at first. Like at first glance you're thinking oxygen negative, oxygen's more electronegative than chlorine. Oxygen's the second most electronegative element. Um, chlorine's happens to be similar to nitrogen in electronegativity. So oxygen's the second most electronegative element. So you might think oxygen would want to be negative, but this Lewis structure, the other one is actually the better one because if we break this bond in half, then we have seven minus seven for neutral for this oxygen, six minus six for the oxygen that makes it neutral. So we choose the Lewis structure that minimizes the magnitudes of formal charge. So think about like the best Lewis structure is almost the one that would minimize the charges. Then we can think about bond polarity. Then we can think about oxygen becoming probably partial negative, but, that, but very unlikely full negative. Well, the, um, yeah, with, I, like, like the, I'm trying to think of a halogen that commonly exists with a deficient octet. Um, but I think, you know, that having an octet is, is probably good for chlorine. Being deficient of an octet for oxygen, it's, it's almost like for oxygen, being deficient of an octet isn't exactly a problem because it can just then just pull the electron back towards itself in the bond. So it's like it has room for electrons, but it's just going to accommodate them through the bond pair shifting towards itself. And it doesn't need to take it from chlorine. Because the, the issue is just kind of where does the balance of charge lie? Do we really end up with a minus one or greater charge? And so we might think this is the better structure. Or do we really end up with the charge that's probably not fully minus one? Because you have to remember chlorine is still relatively electronegative and it's going to fight for that electron pair in the bond. So I think minimize formal charges when you can. So the real formal charge rule is if you have like say three different Lewis structures that are different, they're not equivalent anymore, they're just three different Lewis structures, uh, the one that you want to choose to be correct is the one that minimizes the magnitude of formal charge. So we've already looked at BF3 a bunch of times, BEF2 is very similar in this regard where beryllium only has two electrons. It's not quite metallic like magnesium is, so it's just not going to give up its two electrons and form beryllium two plus as an ionic compound. So we remain with beryllium and forms the single bond with fluorine. We have 16 electrons to distribute. We do that with two single bonds. That's all 16 electrons. Then we end up with beryllium with a neutral formal charge. It has its two electrons still. So formal charge wise, it's happy. Fluorine's formal charge is happy. We know that they're gonna pull the electrons in the bond closer towards itself and go partial negative, beryllium go partial positive. So we can be deficient of an octet, um, and that's perfectly fine, provided that the formal charge, we, what we often will find is that the central atom has a formal charge that's neutral. So if we try to satisfy the octet rule, if we try to put more electrons onto beryllium, guess what? It doesn't have the charge to keep them held onto. It's like we're trying to give electrons to something that doesn't want them doesn't have the charge to keep them held in. So beryllium um, F2, boron F3, those compounds are perfectly fine, reasonably stable, uh, being deficient of an octet. Um, so a couple other Lewis structures, this where we end up with a couple of different possibilities for Lewis structures. Um, NCO, when we give a compound like this, we're almost always telling you the order. So like the order should be N to C to O when we're writing an NCO. If we wanted it to be some other compound, if we wanted O to be the central atom, we would have wrote it NOC. 
Um, now the NCO minus ion should have five electrons for nitrogen, four for carbon, six for oxygen, plus one because it's an anion, minus one charge. And so that gives us a total of 16 electrons. And so I should give the non-central atoms their octet. And then I should think about double bonds. And so this problem here, like we had something very similar. If you go to CO2, it's been a while since we probably wrote CO2, but you had carbon, oxygen, oxygen, lone pairs around, two plus on, on the carbon, double bond one, double bond two, you end up with two double bonds. And so if we're thinking making a double bond, I think we're on the right track here because we're gonna take what was a positive charge that's high on carbon, reduce it down. So right now the formal charge on carbon would be plus. We're deficient of an octet still, so we still have room for more electrons. And so the question would be, like once we make that one double bond, or the question may have even been, why start with nitrogen versus oxygen? You can think relative electronegativity, right? Nitrogen's less electronegative, so it's probably going to allow its electrons to make the double bond before oxygen would. And so now maybe what we're thinking is, do we go nitrogen, carbon, triple, leave the oxygen as the single, where the oxygen formal charge is minus, carbon's formal charge is neutral, nitrogen's now neutral, so that looks to be pretty good. What are some other possible Lewis structures we could write? Well, the other possible Lewis structures that we could write would be nitrogen to carbon double, and then double to oxygen. This would look like the CO2 structure, but with nitrogen in place of one of the O's. The only problem here is that nitrogen's formal charge is negative, oxygen zero, carbon still zero. Now there's, like we might write or think this one, what's wrong with this one? Like that one seems to be good, right? Because now all my formal charges are zero, except carbon is minus. And there's way too many electrons around carbon. So, you know, if you learn anything that you can apply to OCHEM later, never give carbon five bonds. Your OCHEM teacher and TAs will take points off. So that's definitely wrong because uh, expanded octet, we're putting a negative charge on a less electronegative atom. So not a good structure at all there. So that's definitely one we can rule out. And then another Lewis structure we might be able to write here would be, what if we go triple bond to the O, and then so what would that do for the oxygen? Well, it makes it disappear. Um, oxygen plus, lone pair, because we only have six minus five for the formal charge for O. Nitrogen's formal charge here is five minus seven, minus two. So I think it's pretty obvious that we can rule out putting a minus two charge on O and a plus on O, right? Like this doesn't make any sense at all. And so we can rule that structure out. Now these are all, um, like, like are, are these resonance structures? Remember the whole like resonance structures equivalent that get different Lewis structures? These aren't equivalent. So there's nothing equivalent between these structures. So these, I wouldn't exactly say these are resonance structures of each other. These are just different Lewis structures. So we can rule out the one that we crossed out already. Now, what about these two? Which one do you think is better? Let's call one A, let's call the other B. Which one looks better to you? So when we're choosing between Lewis structures that everything satisfying the octet rule, so there's no octet rule differences. If one of them satisfied the octet rule, the other didn't, that might be a, a driving force that might make us pick one structure. But all the, the, the structures are satisfying the octet rule in the same way. Um, so the one I'm going to choose is the one that puts the more negative charge on the more less negative atom. So do you see how there's so many nuances that come into play, but it's really just a matter of when the Lewis structures are equivalent yet different, that's resonance. When the Lewis structures are different from each other, we can choose the one that's best when it puts more negative charge on the more less negative atom if we're choosing between two structures where that's the only difference. The CLO example on the previous slide we didn't choose the one that put the more electronegative charge on the more electronegative atom because we had one that was zero and zero. So if we had a Lewis structure here that had all the atoms with the zero formal charge and could somehow satisfy the octet rule, we might go with that structure, but there's not one that would exist. So that's the, sometimes the tricky part with Lewis structures is like there's layers of nuance, but I think it's kind of like when you're choosing between um, structures that have the same charges, the same octet rule satisfaction, then you just look at electronegativity differences, put the more negative charge and the more electronegative atom. If you're looking at two structures where, where one doesn't satisfy the octet rule, the other does, you might be going with the structure that satisfies the octet rule. You might also be looking at the ones that minimize the magnitudes of formal charge. That we don't want to maximize formal charge just to satisfy the octet rule, though. 
Now N2O, N as a central atom, uh, this is uh, nitrous oxide in terms of a formal name or informal name for it. So it looks something like this. Also has 16 electrons, two times five plus six. We kind of start off with the same basic Lewis structure. And then we have the same basic kind of thought here that we're gonna make a double bond here. Then we make another double bond here. So we end up with a zero formal charge, now a positive formal charge on nitrogen, negative on O. Not quite sure why I added this in because it's really the exact same three type of Lewis structures you could have written for NCO minus. So you have the triple or single, you can flip the triple onto O, but that's bad because it puts plus charge on O. Um, or you could go double, double, if we put the double double then it puts a negative charge on n neutral on o so the lewis structure just like we ruled out for nco minus is bad for nitrous oxide for the same reason so zero minus and plus on the central we want the more negative on the oxygen if that's the only difference so the structure here would be better so look at some of the daily quizzes, look at the practice midterms when they post. The, it almost feels like there's a midterm next week. There's not a midterm next week. We get a whole another week before uh, we take another midterm. Um, we do have a whole other chapter to cover though, but we're gonna get into that here shortly. So one last question from uh, chapter eight for today is to kind of come to a question of what it means to be localized versus delocalized. Like delocalized bonding is resonance. So delocalized bonding is what we talk about in, that's what we call resonance. Like in the NO2 minus, this is delocalized bonding. So we get, the idea is you're taking what could have been a localized double bond. A localized double bond is a double bond exactly where you think it is. A delocalized bond is where you spread it across more than one set of bond. So when we take that double bond and we move it across two different bonds at the same time, this is delocalization. But when I look at something like formaldehyde, where I had these carbon-hydrogen bonds, I had the carbon-oxygen double bond, we did this Lewis structure previously. If you tried to put the lone pairs on O, you got a negative charge on O, positive on C, so you make the double bond, that this double bond is exactly where you think it is. So I just wanted to make sure that we see there's a difference between you know, a localized bond, that's like a bond like it is in formaldehyde, that you get a localized double bond, that just means you get a real double bond, it's not moving over to here and to here, it doesn't delocalize onto those other single bonds like it does in nitrite or in nitrate or carbonate or all those resonance examples. Carbonate shown as one of the other choices. So this one here has the resonance that we were talking about earlier. And I just wanted to make sure that we see the idea that that's delocalizing the double bond across the other three bonds. So this whole process here is delocalization. And so carbonate has a double bond, but it's a delocalized bond. OF2 for OF2, six plus two times uh, seven, that's 20 electrons. So that's just simply where we have fluorine single bonded to our central O lone pairs on the fluorines, that's 16 electrons, four left over, go on to oxygen. And that's neutral formal charged all the way around, so just no double bonds at all in OF2. So only molecule with a localized bond would be answer A. But I just wanna make sure we talk about the difference between localized and delocalized in terms of nomenclature. Okay, so when we get into chapter nine, we'll in a lot of ways reinforce a lot of things we're talking about in chapter eight, because chapter nine gets into uh, three-dimensional shapes, which kind of come back to the Lewis structure as a starting point. So a ton of examples in chapter nine will pick up or begin with a Lewis structure, and then thinking about the shape of the molecule. Um, there's a question here, I think I'll save this for later, just on like a rehash of a bond length problem and calculating charges. You also did a couple in recitation this week, so let's skip that for now. But so what chapter nine gets into is just different shapes of molecules, um, predicting them with something called the Vesper model and getting into some polarity and bonding trends. But I just wanted to show this like, like just to get a rough introduction into this, is just to think that like a molecule like CCL4, we've been writing it like this. Like when we write Lewis structures, I almost always write them two dimensional, meaning I'm not trying to show any three dimensional shape, but we write it 
as if it looks like it's on a sheet of paper as a planar molecule, but it's really not a planar molecule. If you think about these bonds, those bonds contain electrons. We write electrons as dots, but they're negative particles. The bonds are dots, the chlorine atoms, the nuclei repel each other. So wouldn't it make sense that the chlorines would try to get as far away from each other as possible? And that's exactly what happens. So if you have four things attached to a central atom, what's the furthest away they can all be? The answer is in the shape of a tetrahedron. So if we imagine taking a carbon and a chlorine in this direction here, and then have one chlorine coming out at us, one going back, with this type of a geometry here, that's the way that those chlorines can get as far away from each other as possible. These bond angles from geometry can be shown, and it's not worth t doing math to prove this, but the bond angles would be exactly 109.5 degrees all the way around. So that would be the bond angles for a perfect tetrahedron. If we look back at the bond angles in the CCL4 calculation we did, they are precisely not exactly 109.5. There's a weird issue of symmetry that isn't worth getting into, but theoretically they should all be exactly 109.5 degrees. And so then the shape here takes the shape of a tetrahedron. So when you have four, if you will, domains, if you have four either pairs of electrons around a central atom or four bonds, it's going to want to adopt this shape of a tetrahedron. And so then other shapes, if we only have two domains, like CO2 would adopt the shape of a linear molecule. So this bond angle would be perfectly 180 degrees. If we only had three domains on a central atom, like in BF3, perfectly 120. Because the issue is, how can those fluorines get as far away from each other as possible? Now, you might think, why, why don't the fluorines go into the plane? Like, what if we pull the boron out of the plane? Do you see how that would put the fluorines closer together? And so 120 for three things attached is as far away as they can get. And 109.5 degrees is as far away as four things can get from each other. And just to kind of quickly show for five and six, if you have something like PF5, it would take the shape of a sort of trigonal bipyramid. So you get this trigonal pyramid where you have like three atoms on a ring, two atoms straight up and down. So that's what PF5 looks like. And if you have six things, like an SF6, then it adopts the shape of, and we kind of saw that in the calculation if we were to go back to it, it looks like an octahedral molecule. Uh, now, why do we call it octahedral? Well, if you connect all the atoms, you have four atoms here, one atom straight up, I have a four-sided pyramid on the top, and I have a four-sided pyramid on the bottom. So for SF6, we call it octahedral, it's usually about a year after you take chemistry, you go, wait a minute, why wasn't it hexahedral? Because it's like six things attached. But you're not calling tetrahedral tetrahedral necessarily because there's four things. If you go back to tetrahedral, it was a four-sided pyramid. Um, you get a eight-sided pyramid. So it just turns out you get four pyramids on the top, four pyramid shapes on the bottom. So again, if you imagine two atoms here, two atoms here, we have an atom straight down, then we get a four-sided pyramid above and below the shape. So you get an octahedral, an eight-sided, like hedron is the uh, reason why we go with octahedral for the name for things like SF6. So that's just how, when you have six atoms attached to a sing single atom, how they can all get as far away from each other as possible. So I think that would be a good stopping point for today. So just think about how the bonding pair electrons repel each other, and uh, they're gonna try to get as far away from each other as they can. So linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, uh, trigonal bipyramidal, or octahedral, depending on the number of bonds. So we'll pick up from here on Friday. All right, guys, have a good day.